Ще раз, я маю питання особисто до господаря Вячки. Як я собі уявляю, ви народився десь у 30-х годах, народився у Пілі, так? І увесь ваш космополітичний льоз був весь час з боку от Білорусі, а не ніколи на її території. За увесь ваш шлях, як так отрималося, що ви виховали у себе і на своїй жонці таку білоруськість, таку національну свідомість, все залежить від сім'ї і Вільня, на всю історію, я так пам'ятаю, з 37-го, вона вийшла у Совєтський Союз, можна казати, що ви родом з Совєтського Союзу і в той же час ніколи не були ненавідно на Білорусі. Чому ви не... Ну, чому були, а не шмат часу. Де Криниця ви сходили? Ну, Криниця в мене легка. Я родився у місті, яким ми називали столиця Заходній Білорусі. Та столиця була передадена у 39-му церковній годові для Літуби. Для нас це за все застається Білорусі незалежно від того міжа. На сход від Вільні чи на захід від Вільні. Вільня у історії була і буде за все Білорусі. Національна свідомість, але знову це спокійно з батьком. Батько вчився, працював, викладав, брав уділ у політичних справах, діля Білорусі. І сім'я взяла на такий спосіб. Тому, будучи на Вільнщині, навіть коли ви тепер були, не глядячи, що відбувається у самому місті Вільні, бо міста міняються, особливо столиці міняються з тим, хто при владі. Тільки у, не пам'ятаю докладно, тільки у 90-х годах, у середньому 90-х годах, де 51% населення самої Вільні, столиці Литови, були литовці. Були різні національності, не було тих інших. Діля цього Вільня завжди була білоруська, і ті люди, які тут проходять в Білорусі, а були і приїжджені. Наприклад, тепер перетворюються у литовську столицю, бо викладають, вчаться, приїжджають і так далі. Це нормальна діяльність. Але для нас у ті роки і пізній це було. Цікава книжечка Леона Юцкевича «Вандровки по Вільні». Це для людей, які знайомі з Вільнею історично, варто познайомитися з цією книжкою, бо там справді описується кожен камінь у Вільні, який має дочинення до білорусської стіни, незалежно від того, де вважає. І в додатки хотілося. Він зв'язав нас на короткий час. But when he heard that Soviet troops were approaching Prague, he left, crossing into Germany to seek safety in the American zone. The family's plan had been for father to rejoin them in Prague once Soviet troops left Czechoslovakia. That plan changed drastically a few months later when a KGB officer, accompanied by two Soviet soldiers, not on their door. The officer demanded, where's your husband, Jan Stankiewicz? Walter's mother was so upset that she was shaking, and she stammered, I divorced him. She hoped that the officer would then allow her to stay with her family in Czechoslovakia. But when the other officer started looking around, he opened the closet door and saw a large coat and men's shoes, evidence that her husband had been there. We'll be back, the officer stated. Having heard what had happened to others, she understood that the consequences would mean the family being sent back, possibly to a gulag. The Soviets had put up signs in Prague, all people from territories under Soviet control in 1939, which then included Vilnia, must report for repatriation. 
that night, after consulting with her brother, Mary, prepared the four of them to flee quickly over the border toward Pilsen in the American zone. As they arrived by train at the demarcation line, which divided the occupying troops, Soviet on one side, American on the other, the Soviets checked one set of railroad cars and the Americans the other. Walter saw his mother's fear as she watched the Soviet soldiers marching along the tracks. But we were lucky, he said. It was the Americans who checked our papers and allowed us to continue. Eventually, the family arrived at a displaced person camp in Germany and they were able to find their father and live together there for four years. The family still had hope of going back to either Prague or Vilna when the Soviets left. But they soon understood that that wasn't going to happen. And they were forced to look for another place to establish home and finally found refuge in America. Some of these things are probably familiar to all of you. <clears throat> now, um, I had uh, some difficulties in coping with the political and the cultural and the language uh, challenges when we lived in, in Europe. And um, uh, I, oftentimes it was either faith or humor that got me through those experiences. And um, I'll, I'll read one uh, story that was in... Um, in Munich when we first arrived there. <clears throat> My introduction to a new culture was sometimes disconcerting. On the first Sunday after moving to Schwaben, we donned comfortable clothes to stroll along paths in the nearby Englisher Garden. And some of you know, know that area. <clears throat> We skirted the lake and uh, stood a while watching people in small paddle boats. Such a calming contrast to the bustling city life just blocks away. This is almost like New York City's Central Park, I thought, except unlike in Central Park, most people appear to be dressed in their Sunday best. You probably remember that in Germany that's the case. <laughs> then suddenly, as we walked around a bend in the stream, we came upon a group of people with a noticeably different idea of a Sunday outing. Oh my gosh, I said as I averted my eyes. <laughs> a man was standing up, stretching nonchalantly, and he was completely nude. In fact, the whole group was lolling around naked. And I come from a very puritanical American background, okay? <laughs> How can they allow that? Right here, where families with young children are walking, I asked, whispered to Walter. No one seems to be perturbed by it, he answered, gesturing around at the other strollers. I looked around and saw that he was right. No one seemed the least bit concerned. I considered a potential dilemma, dilemma as we became more immersed in the local culture. How could I remain non-judgmental while not uh, subscribing to these different standards myself. Yeah, it was a dilemma. Um, now, I mentioned about language difficulties, and, and uh, um, I have tried to learn Belarusian. I have tried to learn German <laughs> and Italian because um, I was also working in Italy. Um, and I can memorize words, but I guess I'm tone deaf is what they would say, and I can't I can't repeat. And so every time I would try to say something, people, my friends would just laugh at me. And, uh, and finally, I kind of gave up. But um, uh, in, as Walter was so busy with uh, his work at the radio, I really could almost not even talk with him in the evenings. And it was very frustrating. So I, I just felt like I needed to have something worthwhile that I could do, not just be the wife of the director or an American tourist. And so finally, uh, what I did was to find uh, 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 a business that I could build in Italy, because the Tuscan Hills were my favorite place in Europe. And so uh, we had an apartment often in Florence or on the Mediterranean. And uh, so that was a part of my life as well. But um, 
Uh, this is an experience with languages, and this is the last sharing that we'll do. In the beginning, I did attempt to learn Italian. I took lessons, used a dictionary, and tried to say different Italian phrases. But several of my business colleagues continually laughed at my bad pronunciation. I just didn't hear the differences and therefore couldn't re reproduce the words. One language experience in the Rome train station is remembered with chagrin. The train arrived late, and I was relieved to see one of those three-sided telephone cubby holes right next to the track so that I could call my appointment. Since the station was known for its high rate of thievery, I carefully placed my business bag tightly between my legs as I dialed, and I wrapped the long strap of my purse securely around my hand. Suddenly, I was aware that my business bag was being pulled away. I slammed the phone down, grabbed my purse, and sped down the passageway after the dark-haired young man with my bag. I was yelling, thief, thief, in Italian, wondering, why doesn't someone respond to help me? Passers-by just seemed to be looking at me quizzically. Since that wasn't working, I forcefully shouted in English, that's my bag, put it down right now. The thief set my bag on the ground and just kept nonchalantly walking away. I grabbed my bag and leaned against the wall in relief. Later, when I told my Italian friends about the experience, they couldn't stop laughing. I had mistakenly used the Italian word lardo, fatty, rather than lardo, thief. They told me I was actually running after the thief yelling, fatty, fatty, and wondering why nobody was helping me. <laughs> so I, I did try to use humor at times, too. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, through this whole period, I was a strong supporter of Walter's work and uh, have been uh, for all of his acti Belarusian activities. And uh, it was a very exciting time politically because we saw the changes. We saw how bad things were under communism. You know, the people just, no one ever smiled during those times when you went uh, behind the curtain. And, uh, the sense of suspicion and so on. It was just so oppressive. And then we went to live in Prague right early after the changeover of governments. And they still had, had they, they were trying to figure out the new laws and, and changes and so on. It was very chaotic. And sometimes um, we got involved in regard to the, the graft and the corruption and so on building a house and somebody who had lived there is here <laughs> and, uh, and she knows how bad things were <laughs> for us at that point. Um, and, but then gradually things began to improve. Now in Belarus we haven't seen so much of that, but in Prague at least we were seeing that building of a civil society that Václav Havel speaks about and um, helping to participate in some of that, and had those opportunities. And, and so, uh, and then gradually, we, as we went back toward the end of our stay, we saw that the relatives now had owned their own homes and uh, had uh, businesses and were prospering. And uh, we were so glad to see that, at least in Eastern Europe, in that portion, that uh, things were really moving along, although there are still problems. Um, Unfortunately, as we all know, uh, Belarus hasn't had the same kind of progress that uh, many of those countries have experienced. Um, now, I'm open to, uh, <laughs> to uh, questions, if anybody would have any. I would like to ask you a question about Belarus, and I'm going to ask you a question about Belarus, and I'm going to ask you a question about Belarus. I'm going to ask you a question about Belarus. Копію книжки і набуті я по зніженій ціні. Як приклад, я набуті книжка коштує 15 доларів. Коли ви пішли на Amazon, Яткам, там разом з поштою і шипінгом, гендлінгом, вони будуть коштувати 25 доларів. 